So it's lovely to be back again and hoping to hear some fantastic questions from our listeners. We're not going to be talking about any F1 news in this episode. It is purely Ask Damon. Questions for the champ. Pinkles, are you with us? I'm with you, baby cakes. <sighs> They've got me tied to a chair in a in a white room and with a spotlight right in my face. Uh, <laughs> so I will I will do my best to answer honestly. We'll take the gag off. <laughs> So let's have the first question for Monsieur Il. Hi, Damon. I've got two questions, both with a podcast lens across them. Question one, what is your favourite sounding F1 engine and could this be played across the podcast? Question two, what is your favourite sounding engine outside of F1? This could be anything, a Metro 6R4, Supermarine Spitfire, a BDA Escort, etc. I'm particularly interested in your views, given you have a musical bent. Take care and all the best, Darren Tomlins. Guys, this is a good question. I like this one a lot. He's absolutely right. There is a music to the sound of the motor. And I'm, I'm talking mostly, in fact, I'm talking exclusively internal combustion engines. <laughs> Not the, not the not the little whiny one, electric rings. Um, so, uh, yeah, the engine, it's the thing that we get drawn to when someone fires up their motorbike. They, we, I had, I used to have my first prep school teacher used to arrive on a Triumph Bonneville. And the thing is, you knew when he was arriving, he used to arrive to school on a, I, I was so impressed by this guy, he rode a motorbike. But of course, the old Triumph um, Bonneville had a nice distinct sound, a twin cylinder engine, but I, I grew up surrounded by these very, very loud things called Formula One engines. Possibly the loudest engine I ever heard was the Honda V12, which I think John Surtees drove it in the 67 season, perhaps, and 68. And I went to Honda's circuit, Twin Ring Montegi in Japan, and they had the most fantastic Honda museum. And just for me, they decided to pull out the Honda V12 Surtees car and fire it up. It had no tick over at all. It had to be going 10,000 RPM or it wouldn't work. <laughs> and it was terrifying. <laughs> it was the most terrifying but glorious sound you've ever heard in your life. Um, but uh, the question that Darren put to us was, what's the most beautiful? What's the most? Well, I'm, I've got a particular connection with the Renault V10 engine that I raced and won, won the world championship in because it is a lovely, lovely sound. And um, I was asked if I can actually reproduce this on a podcast. If I just played this... That was actually me in the FW18 at Silverstone Classic. So that was a lovely sound. But I think that if you talk about engine sounds, I think there's a magic to anything with an odd number of cylinders. Um, so a three-cylinder, like a Triumph Trident, even a smart car has got a triple, I think it's got a three-cylinder engine. Uh, and of course, V6s and V12s. So the 3, 6, 12 combination seems to provide the best sound harmonically. I don't know what it is. Tom, what's your favourite? Well, has to be a V12 for me, DH. I'm thinking Matra V12. I heard one at the Goodwood Festival of Speed earlier this year, and it's just... Oh, it, it sort of sends shivers. It's, it's so high-pitched. It doesn't sound like a racing engine. It's too high pitched. It's too beautiful. You want always associate power with a raw throaty sound, whereas this is very, very high. As you said, with the, the Surtees engine ticking over at 10,000, that was the same with this Matra. But another engine, now this, I'm afraid, Darren, isn't a Formula One engine, but we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of Mazda winning Le Mans this year with that Wankel rotary engine. I hope I pronounced that right. The Wankel rotary engine. That was so loud that Bertrand Gacho telling me that his ears were ringing for weeks after the race. Ridiculous sounding engine. But I mean, for me, it's all about noise. I associate motor racing with noise. So I love a V12 or a, or a, or a Wankel. And um, 
Yeah. Pinks, how about you? I mean, my earliest experiences, it was all about this assault of the senses, wasn't it? And to feel the noise sort of rattle your ribs is what gripped you. It's what drew you into the sport. And like you, you know, you get that from a V12. Going back to Goodwood is the best way to recapture that. And there's just something quite magical about it. Goodwood Festival of Speed, anyone who's been living under a rock and hasn't gone, go because it takes you there. And, and it does so by this cacophony of glorious sound. Darren also wanted to know about our favourite engines outside of Formula One as well. Well, Damon, was that the, the motorbike, uh, your, your school teacher on his bike? Well, that, one, that would count, wouldn't it? Um, you know, so the, the Triumph Trident. But also he did mention something like the Merlin engine that was in the Spitfires. Of course, they had a lovely, and we had uh, the British Grand Prix, we had a couple of, of them flying overhead. And they, they didn't rev very high. Obviously, they didn't, they didn't have the technology that, back then, but also they didn't want to overstress. The aero engines typically don't they don't want to stress them because they don't want the engine blowing up when you're up in the air. So they tend to rev. They rather had big engines that, that revved at very low RPM. So they've got that lovely lazy sound to them. Oh. How many cylinders, Tom, does a Merlin uh, aero engine have in it? And I, and I don't know the answer to that myself. Oh, I thought, okay, I thought you were being smart. Uh, I thought, yeah, because obviously my theory that it, it might have an odd number of cylinders. Because that's what you yeah. like. So 10 is also an odd number as well, of course. I can tell you're looking it up on your phone. So we're going to get the answer in a very, very shortly. But I mean, I know we've got to think of the planet, but you don't have to use uh, petroleum that has been sucked out the ground and then sprayed into the air. So these engines can still work if we can find a, a fuel for them that is going to be renewable or in some way actually even detracting from the carbon that's in the atmosphere. Of course, I know, Tom, you've spoken to... Paddy Lowe, haven't you? Yes, I did. Um, His zero petroleum. fuels. Yeah. So, so what he's doing is he's taking the carbon out of the air and then making petrol and then he can put it back in again. It just keeps going round in a circle. Those, so the sound of these internal combustion engines are lovely. I actually did like the turbo Hondas as well because they were slightly more muted sound because they've got uh, something in the exhaust pipe. So it's not an open exhaust. It's actually using the exhaust fumes to turn the turbo. So that silenced the engine a bit. So it has a kind of nice, lovely, warm sound to it. Damon, back to that Rolls-Royce Merlin in the Spitfire. I know the answer. I know the answer. How many, how many cylinders? And I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Six? No, more. More. 24. <laughs> <laughs> 12. It's a, it's a 12. Oh, yeah. There you Liquid go. cooled yeah. V12. 27 litres. And... Um, First made in 1933. Of course, 24 is, an, uh, is actually an even number, isn't it? And 12, 12 is. So, yeah, my theory, no, it's a multiple of three is what I was talking about, wasn't it? It's a multiple of yeah. three is, is the thing, which but 10 is so not. it's so throaty, it doesn't sound like the V12 that we associate with motorsport, does it? No, it's a lovely sounding engine. Thanks, Darren. Great question. Let's get on to question two. Hi, Damon, Tom and Pinks. It's Francesco here from Italy. My questions for you are, uh, what was the first album you ever bought? And also, what was the first gig you ever went to? Well, Francesco is into his music. I was intrigued to know what uh, my musical background and history is. Uh, and he asked what album was my first album, which I, <laughs> I'm going to tell you now, was Slade Alive. Now, that means that it was a Slade album at a live gig. And that was probably the first um, but of course we had Beatles records, you know, we had we had all the records. My parents were massive kind of party people, I think it's fair to say. So in those days, they used to have all kinds of records that were popular in the 60s that they would play on this fantastically large gramophone thing that was a kind of huge, great piece of furniture, which had a record player and a tape player and all the rest of it in it. And you stored all your records in it as well. So, I mean, the first one that I could honestly say belonged to me it was given to me maybe for a birthday present was Slade and then the first gig I went to was a band called the Groundhogs at the Roundhouse in London and then after that I went to see Deep Purple at Wembley so those are the first two gigs I'd ever been to and after that punk rock happened and everyone got rid of their their denim jeans their denim flares and uh, we went with drain pipes instead you know how you, you play the guitar and you've got a real passion for music. Does that come from your mum or your dad or could your old man get on the piano? Or? No, he, he, no he, I don't think he was very musical. He used to whistle a lot. Um, 
but I don't think that counts. That sounds Maybe, a bit annoying. That's, it was the way you did it. But um, yeah, so no, my, my, my mum's, all we can work out is my mum's sister was a very talented musician, played violin, apparently, and piano. But um, no, we don't have any history of musicians in our family. But I particularly was into blues. So I had one of my very, very favourite albums when I grew up was called Rhythm and Blues All Stars. And it was all the, the original, you know, going back to the roots of R&B in America. So, um, you know, Howling Wolf and all that, Sonny Boy Williamson and all those blues songs. But uh, that was the basis for rock and roll, of course, and the, and the Stones and, and Led Zeppelin always use those those standards as the kind of formula to, to move on to their more progressive music. And then it sort of went mad, didn't it, and became about concept albums and stuff like that. And then, of course, we needed the, the flushing out of all of the pretension in the music business. And uh, we went back to basics with uh, the Sex Pistols, The Clash and Generation X and uh, yeah, the Buzzcocks and people like that. Johnny Rotten. Johnny Rotten, yeah. He's a mad Formula One fan. I'm sure I seen him at the US Grand Prix one year. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I think he did. I agree. I think he lived in LA for a bit. Formula One does seem to draw pop stars, doesn't it? George Harrison came to a lot of races. I mean, with you. Yeah. No, he was there with um, with Jackie Stewart originally. He he did a song called um, The Master of Going Faster, wasn't it? Or Faster, it was called. And it was, he's the master. It was about Jackie Stewart. So yeah, he loved Formula One. But he used to get into Aintree because they, they lived in Liverpool, obviously, <laughs> famously. <laughs> so they used to have the Grand Prix in Atrium. He, he talked about going to see the race and, and uh, going under the fence and going and see his, uh, the, the stars of Formula One back in those days. So he was always into, even before he was in the Beatles, he was into Formula One. I tell you what, my first album was Roxette. So imagine my joy when Marcus Ericsson told me that he was a friend of the band. Oh, fantastic. I know, who knew? So we did this, like... <laughs> quick fire thing with Marcus Ericsson and I said favourite music and he went rock set and I nearly fell on the floor because that's what I grew up listening to uh, you know as a teenager um, but my first gig was Queen and I remember being on my dad's shoulders at this Queen gig and very shortly after in fact I think it was possibly their very last live performance with Freddie Mercury. Gosh. I mean, that might be a bit of pinkum tax. You know, I add 20% yeah. to everything. But... <laughs> well, hang on. No, but hang on. His last performance was, was Live Aid, right? Yeah, I'm just thinking that that would have been actually... At, do you remember lots and lots of people being there? <laughs> <laughs> I remember Live Aid, but I think it was just before, just before Live Aid. Fantastic. I love, I love the pinkum tax. That's brilliant. Yeah. Francesco, I'm also thinking of, uh, of Pavarotti. I remember... <laughs> Pavarotti coming to the Italian Grand Prix. DH, this was in your time. Do you remember Pavarotti coming yeah. to the? Uh... No, it was. It was. Uh, wasn't it the other one of the tenors? No, definitely. Um, well, no. Was... Uh, there have been various tenors coming, but I remember. I remember Pavarotti coming. Uh, I hope he sang the national anthem. No, he didn't. I don't think they did that back in those days, did they? They didn't make a thing of it before no, the start. Was, well, that was wrong. That was a yeah. big mistake, wasn't it? Well, thank you, Francesco. Great question. If you love listening to great Formula One stories, you'll love F1's new documentary podcast series, F1 On The Edge. It's a collection of seven incredible tales from Formula One history, told by the drivers, team bosses, mechanics, reporters and fans who were there. In F1 On The Edge, legendary figures from the sport share their astonishing memories. Mika Hakkinen tells the story of a secret McLaren invention worth half a second a lap, which was dramatically discovered and exposed by an eagle-eyed photographer. You'll also hear an exclusive recording of a furious Ayrton Senna who is enraged by the upstart rookie Eddie Irvine at the 1993 Japanese Grand Prix. Our very own Damon Hill has some great memories of that weekend. Plus, how David Coulthard survived a tragic plane crash, then raced to a podium just days later. And a breathtaking drama from the early days of the sport, when legendary champion Juan Manuel Fangio was kidnapped at gunpoint on the eve of a race. 
F1 on the Edge tells these incredible stories and more like never before with interviews from Ross Braun, Jacques Villeneuve, Martin Brundle, Eddie Jordan, Steve Nichols and many other F1 greats. All seven episodes are available right now. Perfect listening to get you through the F1 summer break. You can listen for free exclusively on Spotify. You don't need a subscription. Just download the app and search for F1 on the Edge. Okay, next up. Hi, Damon, Pinks and Tom. Gary here. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, by the way, and F1, as I have been since I was a kid. My question this week was just all about the paranormal and UFOs. I've been fascinated by by tales of the paranormal, and um, it got me thinking whether any of you have ever experienced anything you consider paranormal and where you stand on that sort of thing. Are you sceptics or believers? DH, there is a story that you can tell us about testing at Rico. Oh, this is the one where I saw a light in the sky. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, that was see that is that that has an explanation, but at the time I didn't know what to make of it because it did look like something out of you know Close Encounters. It was a thing that was hanging in the sky. There was two things. There was actually two things. One was the comet, which was I think called Hail Bop, and it basically just hangs in the sky with a tail looks like it should be moving but it isn't so that was when i was driving on the track and i was thinking what is that thing in the sky it's very bright and then there was the thing i saw coming back from paul ricard to the airport which was actually a meteorite something different altogether not a comet but the meteorite was was fabulous it just it literally was in the corner of my eye it's one of those things you see a meteorite but you're not quick enough to focus on it, are you? So you see it in the corner of your eye to start with, just something getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And then suddenly it just exploded across the sky and clearly shattered into millions and millions of mini meteorites and then got burnt up on the atmosphere. But it was a fantastic sight. Um, But these are things from outer space. And, uh, you know, here we are, earthbound creatures. And all we can do is look up at the stars and wonder. Now, any of you who follow me on Instagram may remember... Georgie Thompson and myself being at the Belgian Grand Prix and being freaked out, convinced that there were ghosts in the hotel. I say hotel. I mean, it was more like a dodgy youth hostel Um, to the point that Georgie and I just would share bedrooms so that we wouldn't be scared because we didn't want to be on our own. Anyway, I've always had a thing about Belgium. I've always been scared about going to the Belgian Grand Prix. And last time I went... I was absolutely convinced something had gone on. I came back to my room and the door was open. My bedroom door was open and I felt a presence. I'm not kidding. I felt a presence. I felt something. It became a bit of a running joke that I just never wanted to do Belgium. And it's, I am doing Belgium. I'm going to spa at the end of the month, but I'm scared of it. And I don't know what. (laughs) It's become a real issue for me. Anyway, We come out of the room. I persuade one of the producers to move rooms so that he can sort of keep an eye on my door in case there's any kind of weird paranormal activity. And when we leave to go to the track the next day, I said, hang on a minute, what is that across there? And sure enough, there was a graveyard. Our hostel was basically not just next to a graveyard, surrounded by a graveyard. And I felt those weird things before I knew that. Something weird was going on. Add on to that, Natalie, you're walking around in the middle of the night. You probably <laughs> walked through the graveyard asleep. Were there any reports of a strange lady walking around the graveyard in the middle of the night, which, you know, that may have been a, an apparition, or it could have just been Natalie. Yeah, so listen, Belgium, if I look tired on air, it's because I've ever sleep very well in Belgium. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that I think I'm going to be scared, therefore I am scared. Either way, I'm scared. I think you need to move hotels, Pinks. Well, we are apparently this year. Sky have apparently moved <laughs> hotels. <laughs> for you. Well, I don't know, but I did put a concerted amount of pressure on them for a number of years. <laughs> Finally, it's paid off. I used to get strange, spooky feelings in the middle of the night at Spa as well. Well, that's because I was worried about it raining the next day. <laughs> that was <laughs> like nice to wake up literally pressing the brake pedal in the middle of the night. Oh, God, that place is scary. <laughs> Hi Damien, this is Celine in Norway. I remember seeing you do various cameos on different TV shows back in the 90s when I lived in the UK. So what I'm wondering is, what are your favourite TV shows that you've appeared on throughout your career and what memories do you have of filming them? 
Thank you so much. And I love the pod. Hi, Celine. Yes. Oh, gosh. You remember some of my cameos? Um, how embarrassing. Um, I did appear in things like a lot of comedy shows for some reason decided they wanted me to have, have me in them. So there was uh, Harry Enfield famously did some sketch with a guy called Frank Doberman, who was uh, generally just cross with everything and everyone. And so the gag was he was telling me off because he didn't like me driving fast and he was worried that I'd come down his road and if he was to come, if I was to drive down his road at 130 mile an hour he would say Hill no <laughs> and that was the gag so I had to go along with this so the other show I was on with a couple of comedians called Vic and Bob Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer they were very surreal it was sort of Dadaist comedy and they did this uh, gag where they interviewed me dressed as kind of Scottish people kind of quasi Scottish people and uh, put a box on my head and then put a little bit of bacon on my leg and that's in case it got hungry <laughs> stuff like that and the other thing they did to me was they it was a quiz show they had big night out I think it was and they put me in a vat and then filled it up with mushrooms yeah and then left me <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know what happened, but I somehow became the kind of tool for the comedy through the 90s. I'm not sure we can add much. <laughs> Tom, come on. <laughs> you, could, you could say you, you, you liked my cameos or not. You know, I don't think I never did a serious. I can't remember any of them, to be honest. No, well, I, I'm, I'm struggling to remember them. DH, was it one at Brands Hatch? That was the Frank Doberman. Yeah, that yeah. was the Harry Enfield. But um, yeah, it was what you get asked to do and you kind of decide, well, that should be fun. And then basically you're humiliated and made to look ridiculous. So you're kind of a little bit more wary about doing them again. But then, of course, you do it to yourself, don't you? Yeah, a bit of fun. And yeah, it made me realise that uh, I should stick to the day job. <laughs> TV gold, I'm sure. <laughs> and I think we've got time for just one more. And it's a special one. A bit of a surprise for you, Tom and Damon. It is Karen, one of our producers here on this podcast. And I am hugely intrigued to hear what she's got to ask. Hi, team. I'm going to throw you a curveball now because we started off this episode with a question about the sounds of engines, a little assault on the senses. So I'm going to round this off with a question about smells. I find it completely fascinating how strongly our emotions are tied to scent and how a smell can bring back powerful memories. So what I'd like to know is, what's your all-time favourite smell and what memories does it conjure for you? Gosh, Karen, right. What, what we smell, you're right. I mean, whenever you, in a competitive situation, all your senses are heightened because they have to be, of course. If you uh, don't sense that the car is minutely sliding, then you'll miss it and then all you'll, you'll spin off. So you've got heightened senses in, in every department, but a, the smell, of course, uh, although it might not be that important to a racing driver unless they are on fire or something, <laughs> yeah, they might have some electrical problem. But you, you know, you do smell brakes and stuff like that, but it's not as important, I don't think, normally as uh, sensing whether or not you're sliding. But, but Natalie is coming to us live from the scent center of the world, almost, in grass, which is where they make all the perfumes. This is true. Can you smell it? It is, yeah, mm. I could stick my head out the window and give it a good sniff. I'm totally with Karen on smell. One of the smells I most associate with Formula One is when the top three come into the pen soaked in champagne. Because as wonderful it, as it is as a drink, it stinks when it's in the overalls. <laughs> it's so distinctive, but it's not particularly pleasant. And yet you love it because it's a sign of success, victory and joy. Sweat and champagne, I think <laughs> that is. What a combo. <laughs> Jackie Stewart always used to talk about the fact that you could smell the freshly cut grass. You know, you when you're in the middle of a race and someone's been mowing their lawn somewhere across the, the fields in Northamptonshire somewhere, you can smell it. What about that smell when it's been very hot and very dry and then the first few spots of rain come down oh, and you get that yeah. kind of dusty smell, don't you? That yeah. kind of, and that's, it doesn't last for long. It's just a little bit for a small while fresh, and then just, it gets washed away. Yeah. Just fresh and exciting, isn't it? I love the smell of freshly cut grass as well. But a little story for you guys. God, back in the 80s, I was still at school and I wrote a letter to Harvey Pothelswaite, who at the time was the technical director of Ferrari. And just on the off chance, I said, look, there's a Silverstone test coming up uh, just before the British Grand Prix. I would love to come to the test. Is there any chance you could sort something for me? And unbelievably, I wrote to about four different teams. 
Harvey Pottlesweight got back to me and said, please come to the pre-British Grand Prix test and be my guest. So I went to that test and I went into the Ferrari garage and Gerhard Berger was driving. And why this is relevant to this question is one of my, the, the most powerful smells, I, and I associate it with Formula One so much, is the smell of that Ajit fuel as they were putting it in the car. Oh, because that was sort of rocket fuel back in those days, wasn't it? And they were getting so much horsepower from the fuel. So <laughs> Harvey Pottlesweight, legend, rest in peace, ushers me into their garage. And the first thing I'm hit with and almost floored by is the smell of of this rocket fuel being put in the back of the car. And he, he saw me sort of wince and he went, oh, you, you better come to the front of the garage. You don't want to inhale that. No, he was he was right. That stuff was highly dangerous stuff <laughs> do not yeah. know and they, we used to have a elf chemist when i was racing and her name was um valerie and she obviously knew what was in the fuel because she had to analyze it and she, she had a little machine at the back of the garage where she analyzed the, the oil and the fuel and stuff every time they started the car she went out the garage i said valerie why do you go out the garage every time they start because i know what's in the petrol <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't it be fun to bring karen to a race and just get her to experience the smells that we get in the pit lane even without the dodgy fuel now you've still got the brakes and the tires and everything great question kb well what a pleasure guys it's been lovely to have you back natalie well thanks to everyone for those questions of course we are filling in time until the season gets underway again very very soon keep the questions coming to ask damon hill at gmail.com I'll second that. It was great to have so many questions. We can't wait to get back at it ahead of the Belgian Grand Prix. Next episode out, of course, next Tuesday on the 24th, ahead of that race at Spa, ghosts and all, on the 29th. But for now, that's it from us. F1 Nation is produced by Formula One in association with Audioboo. Au revoir.